what to make of England's attack. Moments of hope, plenty of despair. We're going to look at it in depth in this episode. Hello, amateurs, and welcome back to our Hot Topic series. This one is inspired by the current Six Nations, and I'm putting out a ton of content during the Six Nations and beyond. So give that subscribe button a tap to make sure you don't miss out on any future content. But in this episode, we're going to be looking at England's attack, and to discuss it, I've got one of my most popular former podcast guests with me, Mr. Phil Greenaway. Phil, how are you doing? I'm very good, thanks, Tim. How are you? Very well, very well. Now then, let's get this going. Before we look at what England are doing now, I think it could be informative to see where they've come from. So just give me a little rundown, a little overview of what we saw from England's attack during the World Cup. Uh, I think, you know, we saw England just, uh, they, they had really good basics at the World Cup. Scrum line out was absolutely superb and they got their launch right into those plays. Um, uh, fairly pragmatic approach. Um, and I think, you know, if we're honest, they came unstuck in the semi-final against a side who were really nervous to get to the final. But I think England's attack really was, you know, not, not it wasn't the most complicated attack. It was very simple. They executed it really, really well. Uh, and they did the basics well and they got through the games they needed to get through uh, unscathed. Um, was it the most breathtaking rugby to watch in the world? Probably not, but it was a World Cup and, um, you know, they, they did all they needed to do. And they probably got as far as I think we all expected them to get, yeah, if we're honest. Yeah, I'd, I'd say that their attack was more based on kicking and kick pressure as opposed to multi-phase attack, for sure. Um, particularly anything up to the final third. You know, they weren't running anything from the middle third at all. No, uh, I don't think we saw one real attack from, you know, deep in their own half or there was a very, very little counter-attack. Uh, they used the long kicking game of, of, of Elliot Daly, etc., to, to get field position and force field position. Um, they clearly had done their homework on opposition lineouts. Um, you know, so they were happy to kick the ball off the pitch and then compete at line-out time. Um, uh, a lot of box kicking from, from nine, and, uh, and again, putting pressure on, on that kick chase uh, with Johnny May and in particular, you know, really making a menace of himself. Um, so, yeah, it was very. And then once they got in the 22, it wasn't a great deal of width on their attack, really. It was very, very sort of tight to the to the ruck or tight to the scrum. Uh, then pick and go. And uh, a lot of those score, scores were, 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 were uh, you know, a, a yard out, two yards out or catch and drive from a penalty from a resulting um line out drive from there really so yeah limited um but but effective in the world cup yeah okay cool as we move through this we'll take a look at what england are trying to do with the ball now through each third of the pitch we'll get to the attacking third but let's start in the, in the defensive third i'm not seeing too much change from what happened during the world cup to now i think they're going from stable ruck to box kick either off the pitch or keep it on, depending on whether they feel like they can attack the opposition line out or whether the opposition have got, you know, a threat in terms of counter-attack. Is that what you're seeing or are you seeing anything different? No, uh, you know, I've got to be honest, seeing, seeing exactly the same. Um, I, I've been surprised to see, uh, we talked about James Lowe and his left foot the other week. We, I've, I've seen less of that off-structured phase inside, you know, their own third. They've not really used their kicking options. They've only really used, you know, the nine and ten as their kicking options as a way out. They've not shifted the ball two passes and kicked on an edge a great deal from their own third. Um, and, you know, obviously, you know, the type of kicking game you play depends situationally in, in, in the game. You know, whether you're up by points or whether you've just scored and you really want to consolidate or, you know, you actually, we need to chase the game now um, and we need to kick a bit more attacking-wise. So, but certainly from that, 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 that third, their own third, very similar, Tim. It's, it's it's nine or ten kicking long, um, fifteen blokes chasing after it, or not fifteen, but you know a good, a good number of people chasing after it, trying to pinch them in and trying to force errors. Um, so yeah, not I, I would say not a, deal, a great deal has changed. Yeah. Okay. What about the middle third? Uh, let's move on to that. This is kind of the real transition period of the pitch, where teams you can really tell what a team's about by what they do with the ball in this third. What are you seeing from England now during this Six Nations? Uh, I think there has been a little bit more intent. Um, you know, the try they scored first off against Scotland, you could you could argue that that was uh, in the middle of third, I guess. Um, so a little bit more of attacking intent, but maybe only playing one or two phases and then looking for that kick. But they have maybe changed the kicking game slightly. There are a few more chips in behind, a few more grubbers. But um, I'm not sure if that's the same as you're seeing, Tim, but, you know, 
still catch and drive, you know, off the lineups, maybe one launch, maybe play for one phase or two phases and then really, you know, looking to kick again from somewhere. But the kick might be slightly different. Yeah, it, it's very similar to what I've, what, what I've observed. I think they're definitely trying to play more from the middle third. During the World Cup, I don't think they played at all from the middle third, um, aside from the Chile game, obviously. Uh, but I am seeing some signs that they want to try and evolve their attacking game, that they want to start from further down the pitch. And although it hasn't particularly been successful, they, although there was the one try against Italy that I think started from the middle third. So um, I'm seeing some positive change there in terms of attacking intent, for sure. Now then, let's get into the attacking third. What are, what are we seeing here? Are there any differences that you've spotted? Uh, I think they're trying to play. Um, but unfortunately, you know, if you take Scotland game at the weekend, the skill set, it, it was really tough to see what they were doing because they were, you know, sort of play one phase and there were so many drop balls and so many really basic errors. Um, so I'm not seeing... Uh, I'm sure there is intent, but I'm not sure, sure. It's not the most sophisticated attack, you know, in terms of multi-phase, you know, again, comparing them with Ireland, who, who've, you know, been involved in their attack over a, a long time. There doesn't seem to be many layers to England's attack. Um, once it goes, you know, to slow ball, we really are tending to just see forwards in and around the ball. And there's no real trying to generate that attack and generate width. And one area where I think England are really struggling is just a, the depth of that they're coming onto the ball at. There's no one really adding, a, you know, a real load of pace and energy onto the ball and really trying to bust through tackles. Um, and there doesn't seem to be a great deal of subtlety in the England attack either. You know, there's not a great deal of, you know, 10 shifting across the pitch with two or three options inside, outside. And if they do play outside, my general feeling is, and maybe this is old school because I was always told to, to, to stay deep, but there's very little depth in, in our attack. Um, and, you know, I'm not sure we fill the pitch enough. We have the, the winger really wide, but then that's really only a kicking option because we've not got players to fill that space to be able to pass the ball to him from deep enough. So, um, yeah, that's what I'm seeing. And maybe that's a little bit ultra critical, Tim, but, you know, again, I'll, I'll, I'll pass the, the, the baton back to you. Yeah, I mean, generally, I, complete, I agree, but I think we have seen tiny moments where they have had the depth required they have had people flowing and the passing working. And I'll, I'll say the um, the Elliot Daly try against Italy would be a good example of that, where I thought the depth was excellent. But once they got into games and once they struggled to get good starting positions or starting possession, quality of possession, they've really struggled to do that. They've really struggled to get moving forwards again. Um, OK, so we kind of touched on this a little bit. And essentially what we're saying is that it feels like what England are trying to do is very difficult to analyse at the moment. Um, and one of the reasons is poor quality primary possession. Uh, so what, you know, particularly for this, the lineups against Wales were really low quality. Like they won a lot, but the, the quality of the ball was bad. Is there anything else that's sort of stopping England before they even get started? Uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, uh, the, the try that Van der Merwe scored at the weekend, you know, where England tried to move the ball, uh, drop balls, you know, just it looked like Slade and um, Furbanks had just sort of confused their line as to who was going to be picking that ball up, who was going to be receiving that pass. Um, so, you know, I think it's, I think it's really tough to, to sort of analyse exactly what they're doing. Um, and just a bit of confusion with, you know, starting wide and hitting on lines or starting on the inside and drifting with a pass and trying to peep people on the drift, which 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 worked for the first try that England scored against them, against Scotland at the weekend. So, um, again, I think, you know, you can have those starter plays, but it's just the subtlety with which they're, they're playing. So, I think, really, are we filling the pitch? Are we asking enough questions of, of a 13, where I think is the toughest place to defend on a rugby pitch off first phase? Um I, I do hope that it, it develops, though, because as you said, you know, there's been some some uh, some subtle change in terms of we think they are trying to play more, um, but really the sort of core basic skills of catch pass, I think, letting them down at the weekend. Yeah, there was some there was some real bad ones where it was just a drop pass, but there was some where the timing was just off as well. And the one that I'm thinking here was when Slade hit Earl's left arm with a pass. And initially watching that, I thought he was trying to pass it to Earl. But actually, when you look at the replay, I'm pretty sure he was trying to pull it out the back to Ford. And maybe Earl was just a little bit behind where he should have been or the timing was just off. Talk to me about that. Like, 
why why is the timing off in these games? Why is it not quite working? Well, I think it's about you know repetition in, in training and uh, and really understanding why you're running the line. And and these are all international rugby players. They all should they all know. Um, but it's moving in, you know, <clears throat> getting those players to be used to working with each other all the time. Um, I think Earl has been one of England's standout players throughout the, the whole of the Six Nations and, and from the World Cup. But, you know, as a group, um, are they are they really nailed down and really honed down, really understanding their roles, you know, whether they're hitting the short line, whether they're coming out the back, do they really understand their role and then their next role off the back of that. So if the ball gets put behind them, are they then resourcing the next ruck? Um, if the ball's pulled out the back, what are they looking to do then? Have they got an inside option? Have they got a wide option? Have they got a short option? And who are they hitting off the back of that? And it's not easy. It's not easy to get that timing right on a wet, crappy day at Murrayfield. Um, but I do think it comes back to you know repetition and really you know people understanding their roles. And look, we all make mistakes. We all make mistakes under that sort of pressure. But I just think that um, you know, hopefully it, it, will, it will continue to come, but it'd be really nice just to see it, it work for them every now and again, just so they can, you know, really <clears throat> get the benefits of, of, of the hard work they're putting in in training. Yeah, and it should be said that that move has to be really razor fine. Like the ball almost does have to graze Earl's shoulder as it's going past to look be effective. Otherwise, you know, players can just move off of that and it's very yeah. easy. So it's very, very fine margins here. Yeah, absolutely. It's really, it's really fine margins. Like you said, you know, if I think 10, 10 has got to take the ball to the line or wherever the first receiver has got to take the ball to the line um, because that gets people to sit in a defensive line. So I think that's something that they need to work really hard on is are we just standing flat and catch pass or are we actually attacking the line to be able to hold defenders and the movement's coming? Because at the moment it feels like people are just rushing England because they're all stood a bit flat and, and because 10's flat and no one's moving if 10's moving, it's easy to get your timing off of 10. If 10 moves the line, even if it's a couple of paces towards the line and then comes across, just makes life every, everybody's life a little bit easier. Um, so I definitely think that's something that they can they can work on is just 10 coming onto the ball rather than just standing flat. You watch Finn Russell, he doesn't just stand at the game line and play flat. He, he starts deep and he comes onto the ball, you know, and there's a real subtle difference between standing flat, standing deep and coming onto the ball and then standing deep to kick or standing deep to just to shift the ball really, really wide. So um, first receiver position, I think, is, is really, really important. Um, and I said, and I think, you, you know, that that it is tight. It is really, really tight in terms of, you know, the out-to-in runner. You've got to come fairly late to hold anybody. Otherwise, you will just drift, drift off behind you. And as you said, no one wants to be that second receiver out the back when getting absolutely nailed from out to in, in line when you're catching the ball there and Tupelotto is hitting you on the outside shoulder. So, yeah, definitely for me, first receiver on the move, moving towards, maybe starting deeper and coming onto the ball and really challenging that game line, but not just standing flat. I think there's a subtle difference there between those two things. Yeah. One of the things you mentioned a little while ago there as well was resourcing rucks. And I think one of the other reasons that we saw a stunted England attack on Saturday, in particular against Scotland, was that Every ruck seemed to be a dogfight, and there's cr huge credit to Scotland in that respect. You know, they made it that way, and it made the quality of England's possession, again, quite poor a lot of the time. But I feel like England should be in charge of that. They should be on the front foot. They should be making sure that those rucks are clean so that Danny Kerr can move the ball without any issues. What are you seeing around that? Yeah, again, I think that's really, uh, it's a really fair point. I think if you're, if you're on the front foot, if you're over the game line, um, rucks become quicker um, because you're in behind and then the defence is scrambling to get back. They've got to get back around the back foot. Um, if you're constantly getting tackled on the game line or behind, then you know, your own players have got to come back and resource the ruck from behind the game line. Um, and that's why we talk about the game line being so important. You know, if you can get across the game line once, you know, then it becomes easier to go around and get around the corner and get across the game line. And as soon as you've got one slow ruck, you're inviting yourself to for people to absolutely, you know, come balls out and really challenge that ruck. And we used to call it fire. You know, they would fire those rucks and really look for those for those turnovers. And you know, if you're carrying the ball into heavy contact, it becomes really, really tough to to find a shoulder because everyone's coming on to you and coming on to you and coming on to you. So as soon as you've had one one ruck behind the game line, it does become difficult to to really generate pace and uh, into the game from there. Absolutely. OK, you uh, went and watched the Open England training session last week. 
And we fully understand. Look, England aren't going to be sharing any big secrets in these training sessions. We understand that completely. However, it, I understand it was quite informative. So tell me, tell me what you saw and what your thoughts were uh, having having watched that training session. Um, look, what I did see was was everyone in an England shirt working really, really hard. That's definitely what we saw. You know, they they really, you know, they worked hard. They're really putting a shift in, um, cared deeply about the about the game, and prepared, you know, fully fully for for the Scotland game. Um, I, I guess uh, the disappointment for me was was seeing how many balls were, were dropped on the on the day. Um, that could be because they're trying things at such high speed, at such fast pace that you know they're trying to put themselves under so much pressure that they, they expect those mistakes. And I understand that, but um, from an international team preparing for a for a big for a big game, I, I would have liked to have seen a, a, a better quality catch pass, particularly under pressure. Um, and then you know the real width on the game um, I, I, and the depth are the two things that I didn't see that I was really hoping I, I would see evolve. Um, you know, through that process, uh, England's back three uh, worked really, really hard, incredibly hard on 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 catching big high balls. So they're expecting a lot of that from Finn Russell. Uh, defensively, they were working really, really hard, getting off the line. Um, so there's plenty to see. But from an attacking perspective, uh, yeah, I, I love England rugby team, but I was I, I was really <laughs> underwhelmed by what I saw from an attacking perspective on the day. That lack of width, that lack of real real structure. Um, yeah, so that was that was it, it was a tough watching part, so I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, and, and they did do 15 on 15, right? There was like full pitch essentially, you know, training where you'd hope to see shapes, patterns, all this kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, look, I think loads of teams are attacking the short side really well, and I think that's what Alex Mitchell brings. I think he does attack down the short side really, really well. Unfortunately, we did it did it in training on that on that open training session. That's when he got injured um, and we saw him get carried off. Um yeah, so there was there was 15 on 15. Uh, the tackles weren't, I would say, fully, you know, going to into each other. Um, but there was certainly a hole and a grab and I put them on the floor. And then there was definitely competition at the ruck, um, which was good. Um and and good energy, right? I mean, the you know, the ball and play can't fault the guys. I mean, their GPS stats for the day must have been through the roof. They all worked really, really hard, but uh sometimes sometimes i think you've got to slow things down just to create understanding and you know what are we doing from here what's our aim uh, maybe that was done pre coming out um uh but yeah it was a it, it was it was a real privilege to be there um but as a, as a as an england rugby fan and a and a, and a coach of sorts not that i'm coaching at that level by any stretch of imagination um it, it was t- it was a, it was tough watching part Mm. Now, interestingly, I think the Eddie Jones England were trying to transition to this non-structured attack, this non-framework uh, almost. Uh, we want to try and not be obvious. We want to try and not be predictable. And I just don't think they ever got there. I think that's where they were headed. I think they were trying to do that. Do you think they're trying to do the same here? Do you think this is a deliberate ploy that will carry on beyond this Six Nations? Or do you think it's just that they're focusing on defence at the moment, so they're just going with a, a really basic, simple attack that, you know, just leaves it up to the players, essentially? Uh, yeah, yeah, possibly. Yeah, quite quite possibly. Um, you know, I'm not sure that England have found their their best back line at the moment. I'm not sure they found their best, you know, team. Um, and whilst you're going through all of that, I, I think... You know, they're definitely working really, really hard on D. I think you can see the real positives behind behind that. Um, and yeah, I wouldn't be surprised if, if this attack layers over layers over layers over time. So, you know, so initially they're just going to focus on what they're doing now, which is their launch and the next phase. And over time, their multi-phase, their, their, their play, um, you know, the play particularly between the 15s on the pitch. I think I hope we'll see that evolve o- over time. I think that's what we, that's what we're looking to see, um, and also they need to be really comfortable that their best fifteen are their, are their best fifteen. Um, and I'm not sure we're there yet. I'm not sure we know who, you know, who, who who's playing nine, who should be playing ten, um, and I think that's that's that must be a struggle. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, okay, you've mentioned a few things there that we think England can improve on in terms of the tens role or the first receivers role. I'm going to add to that. I think and you kind of mentioned this as well yourself, like we need some deception in the forward carries. 
At the moment, it's just very much one runner, carry, try and smash that ruck as quickly as we can. I think we need some option of passing. We need some footwork. We need to get on a soft shoulder so that ruck is in a very positive place. I think that's a big work on the England could be better at. Is there anything else that you think that uh, would be not quick fixes, but things that you've seen that, you know, that England can improve? Um, yeah, I, I, I genuinely think the depth that they're playing at in the outside third of the pitch. So when we're talking about, you know, between the 15s, if we're coming out the back, you know, we've got to be really, really deep enough to be able to catch pass and I suppose or catch the ball, be able to look up and then make a decision based on what's seen in front of us, you know, whether that's catch, whether that's, you know, run, pass um, or, or kick, the, all of those options are open. I'm just not sure we've got the, the time in our hands. Even when we shift the ball to the wide channel now, you know, how many times have we really seen our winger taking it at pace and flying? You know, I haven't seen that for, for a little while. So just being you know, the ability to, to to move the ball to those spaces and, and get people you know running hard in in behind defences and that in those outside 15 meter channels, um, and that comes from a lot of what you just said, Tim. That comes from the deception in the middle, from holding players in that middle third. Um, you know, so there are our 15 and our wingers and our 13 have got real space to operate in. Um, so definitely for me uh, is depth, and then. I also think, you know, real width, you know, real genuine width. And, you know, I know that a lot of the rugby stars is from, you know, coming around the corner and playing, you know, out and getting people to bite. Um, but you you get to win the, the ruck every time in a game of rugby league and the defence have to be 10 metres back every time. And if you get hit behind the game line in a game of rugby union, you know, you, there's a counter ruck, there's a turnover, there's all those sort of things. So, I'd really like to see us, you know, that genuine width and shift the ball nice and early. Can we? How early can we get the ball into the 15's hands? How early can we get the ball into to our wingers' hands? And then I don't mind us kicking on an edge. If we've had a crack at them, there's nothing on, and we kick long down the channel with a chase. It's you know um, uh, moving forward. You know that's all right. But um, I, I just would like to see us have a real, real go. We've got some bloody good players. Yeah. It's funny, I'm, I'm interested in our takes on this because you're talking very much about the backs and I'm talking very much about the forwards, which is you know, how, we, how we both played the game. And I've got another one actually on the forwards as well. What I saw in the Scotland game on Saturday was we quite often changed direction and came back to players that were still retreating. So like, we need to reload much, much quicker. Um, so that they're then absolutely genuine options to carry the ball forward. You know, I, there was a couple of times Danny Kerr picked the ball up, changed directions, looked, and the players were almost in front of him. So that's another one for me. Like we need to reload it in those channels much, much quicker. Yeah, I, I'd agree with that entirely. And that comes from a back's perspective as well, because, you know, often the change of direction to come back. You, know, you, you watch again, I keep talking about Ireland, but they do it brilliant well. Gibson Park goes back down that blind side everybody's reloaded and they're all coming on to the ball at pace and it makes it really, really tough to defend. Makes it really, really tough to defend aggressively anyway. You can defend it, you know, on a soft edge and you push them towards the touchline, but they've eaten up yards there. So I think everybody's reloading and reloading with depth. So you're a genuine option. And, you know, I like to see, you mentioned about fours just crashing off, you know, nine or crashing off 10 on their own. I think to get defenders to sit, you need an option of, you know, you might, I might actually pass the ball at them at some stage, you know, and those little tip-ons uh, inside and outside, you know, and the late footwork to be able to push through, maybe get hands through, maybe offload. Um, yeah, I'd like to see all of that, particularly, you know, that, that reload back down the blind side. How quickly is our winger and our 15 getting back on their feet from the touchline ruck to then be a genuine option to go again against retreating forwards who might be getting off the floor from the same ruck, you know? Yeah. OK, to sum all this up, we kind of, you know, we've seen lots of things, but we really don't know exactly what England are trying to do because it is so unstructured. It is so, you know, not by playbook. Um, is there anything else, Phil, that you want to say just before we sort of wrap this one up? No, uh, I think we're all hoping it's going to be different. I think we're all going to hope that uh, England will surprise us against Ireland. Uh, I really hope they do. I'm struggling to see it um, at the moment, but I think... <clears throat> You know, if England can get a win by playing some decent rugby at home against Ireland, then, Tim, we, we lose our jobs as podcast hosts. <laughs> OK, I am personally hopeful. I am 
uh, I'm happy that England are trying to play. That's what I like most because I've watched England play for quite a number of years now where we've been so negative in our attack and approach that I'm just happy with the intent at the moment. I believe it will come. I trust in the players. That's what we think. That's what um, I think anyway. Uh, well, what do you think at home? Uh, is there anything we've missed about this attacking England team that you think is really important? I'd love to hear it in the comments down below and we'll join you there for a conversation. Give this video a thumbs up while you're down there. If you don't mind, it helps other people find it. Phil, thank you so much again for your time and valuable insight today. My pleasure, Tim. Take care. Cheers, mate. And people at home, you can subscribe there. You can watch that one next. And don't forget to get out and play.